Hello and welcome to the conversation with the Invictus Games Foundation, learning and emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic and the role of sport. I'm JJ Chalmers and it is a great pleasure uh, to be part of this conversation today and to be guiding you through what is an absolute a brilliant array of speakers. Uh, but before I get into things and we start meeting some of the most inspirational individuals from across the Invictus Games community uh, and family. Not to say that this man isn't an inspiration, but it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, my very good friend and the CEO of the Invictus Games Foundation, Dominic Reed. Thanks very much, JJ. Um, very kind of you. Great introduction. I'd like to start this afternoon by welcoming everybody uh, to today's edition of the Invictus Games Foundation conversation. Uh, as JJ said, this is about learning and emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic and about the role of sport. <clears throat> um, we at the Foundation are very grateful to the Armed Forces Covenant uh, Fund Trust for enabling this webinar. We're also very glad to have the support of Ascot Rehab, the Fisher House Foundation and ISBS Handa. We thank them all for their support because without them we couldn't do it. The conversation, as some of you will know, uh, started life as an idea for a real live symposium. Do you remember when we all used to get together and meet in rooms face to face? We were going to do that on the day before uh, the Invictus Games in The Hague in 2020. We're now looking at an Invictus Games in The Hague in 2022. Um, and, and what has happened is that the conversation has grown into a series of really interesting uh, debates and conversations uh, that's become very necessary to fill the void of, of real human contact during COVID. So it's been a really uh, good thing that's emerged uh, f f f from hardship. I'd like to start by, by welcoming two uh, uh, people who are absolutely central to what we do. Um, uh, first of all, our new chairman, uh, Lord Allen, Charles Allen. Charles is is a um, a stellar businessman. Um, he's been uh, uh, chairman of Global for some time. He was uh, uh, he ran ITV, and he is uh, has just taken over as chairman of Balfour Beatty. Um, but he's no stranger to sport. He ran the Commonwealth Games in Manchester, and um, and he became the mayor of the Olympic Village in London, 2012. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be working with Charles going forward. And uh, Charles, welcome to your first conversation. Uh, and I know that you want to, uh, to to say a couple of words. Dominic, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to just say a few words, having just taken over the chair of the, the Federation. But I also want to pay tribute to Keith. Keith basically did a fantastic job from the beginning and carried the baton through to today. So, Keith, thank you for creating this opportunity. I really look forward to working with all of you uh, in this role, and I'm really passionate about, about the impact the Invictus Games Federation can have on everyone's lives, everyone who's involved with it, and including my own involvement. Also, the Federation has proved uh, the Federation's conversation has proved, as, as Dominic said, to be a very valuable part of bringing Victus community together, whether that's competitors or teams or nations or staff, to, import, to discuss the important issues that's common to, to all of us and, and really have an impact on what we call the influence pillar. The key objective was really to share best thinking and best practice amongst all the nations and the Invictus Games family. And as you know, we started this conversation at the start of the pandemic, and it's really proven to be incredibly successful. This is our fifth conversation. And with your support, there's real momentum growing behind it. And people are feeding back that they've got a lot from these conversations. I really look forward to hearing your views today. We've got some amazing speakers and some in inspirational uh, comments and, and views. And also hear some of the lessons you've learned, because it's about sharing those lessons that we can all impact in each other's lives. Following the feedback, this session is more interactive. And that's why I'm delighted that JJ Chalmers has agreed to facilitate the session. And thank you, those of you who have agreed to speak. Enjoy today's conversation. Thank you. Dominic. Thank you, Charles, very much. Um, great, great introduction. And, and I hope, as, as Charles says, everybody enjoys the day. Um, I, I now want to introduce Connie Wenting. Some of you may know Connie. Connie is the CEO of The Hague 2020, which has became The Hague 2021 and is now The Hague 2022. Um, she's, I, nobody could ask for a better colleague. To be honest, she has been magnificent in, and as have 
all of her team in, in delaying the games and contingency planning around that delay, not once, but twice. So um, uh, Connie and uh, Connie's team and my team, Connie and I have worked together very, very closely. It's um, Connie's games that's coming up in, in uh, April next year. Uh, Connie, thank you for your patience and your hard work and, uh, and welcome to this conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Dominic. Um, there's a saying, tree is a charm, right? So um, uh, we're lucky that indeed uh, we were able to push out. So I'm really, really, really looking forward um, uh, to meet each other in, um, um, in April 2022. So um, I hope you can all block your calendar indeed, uh, April 15th. Hopefully we can have the next um, um, uh, IGF conversation face-to-face -face in The Hague, uh, just the day before we uh, kick off the Invictus Games um, in The Hague. Um, what we've seen and also what I've experienced is the value of these sessions, because I think uh, the power of sports and rehabilitation and all the conversations that we had over the last couple of years, uh, postponing the games and to see what we could offer uh, for the community, not just for the competitor, but also for the friends and family. Uh, and, and, you know, also the, the, uh, the importance of the family unit. Um, the Evictus Games conversation has shown as a very strong vehicle. So um, I'm, I'm really happy that we can support these valuable sessions and uh, moving forward. I think we have some good topics uh, coming up uh, just before we will see each other on April 15. There will be another of couple uh, of online conversations. So please uh, keep sharing uh, the best practices uh, within the community. But I think it's also very good that we can uh, share the knowledge that uh, you know, the Evictus Games Foundation has built over the last couple of iterations outside the Invictus community, because I think there are very valuable lessons to learn. So happy to support this and really looking forward to meet you all April 15 next year. So enjoy your afternoon and see each other in The Hague next year. Thank you. Thanks, Connie. JJ, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, Connie, may I also add, uh, what a fantastic Eurovision uh, that the <laughs> Netherlands has just held. And, and actually, what an encouraging sight it was to see um, you know, such a bright, exciting uh, comp uh, you know uh, event happened but also in such a safe manner um so really yeah. encouraging stuff as the world begins to open up uh, just a little bit uh, and hopefully in the not too distant future uh, sites like this will be not so commonplace uh, I, I was actually injured in afghanistan back in 2011 and when i was in my hospital bed recovering it was my brother's wedding and i did my best man speech uh, from my hospital bed via Zoom. Now that story has been a good story for about the last 10 years, but now in the last year or so, people are having entire entire weddings online. So uh, it's lost some of its edge uh, in the last little while, but it's time to really get into it. Um, as you say, uh, as has been pointed out, this is the fifth iteration of the conversation. Uh, this would have been the 2021 games would have been taking place uh, sort of throughout these dates. Uh, so we are just, edging ever closer to doing this in person. But let's get right into the conversation now with session one. So we're going to get into session one, which is uh, participating nations, teams, competitors, family and friends. Well, that's for a shorter term, the Invictus family, let's be quite frank. Uh, and it's the lessons that we've learned during the coronavirus pandemic uh, and the role the sport has played within it. Uh, so I'm going to introduce people sort of one by one and we'll hear from each of them for about five minutes. Now, it's fantastic. We've got people uh, from all across the Invictus family and from all across uh, many of our participating nations uh, represented as well. So to kick things off, uh, it's my absolute delight to introduce Consuela Moore. Uh, she is a former U.S. Olympic athlete. She's now the head coach of uh, the U.S. Invictus team. Uh, she was instrumental uh, most recently in, in arranging a very successful virtual competition between the U.S. and Ukraine uh, in late uh, 2020 uh, in indoor roaring and powerlifting. And that actually is where I'd love to start off, if that's all right, because that was that was a huge success and a real opportunity to take, you know, find some some positivity um, out of it, out of the manner of adapting to the challenge of the last year, hasn't it been? It was a 
you know, competition is something that athletes crave on a regular basis. And I just told an athlete yesterday, an Invictus athlete yesterday, is you're trying to hold stallions back in the starting gate, right? And they just want to be set free. So the the initiative to bring together with Invictus athletes is like, hey, if Team US is going through this, it's a good chance that other countries are going through the same thing, right? So that's how the idea kind of came to be. It was like, hey, let's get other countries involved and see who wants to do it. And of course, we're more than happy that Team Ukraine wants to pull it off. So we have to say, okay, what sports can we do on Facebook Live and still be viewer friendly and not um, and not look too confusing? Uh, we've done it with the Air Force several times. So with the Invictus competition, we just tightened some things up and it was it was a show. It was exciting. Now, competition, as you say, is really important, but actually um, the fact that we're allies is so important and, and really just creating relationships is one of the, you know, one of the really key things within this, wasn't it? It was. And we've had a partnership with Ukraine before. Um, some of you all may know that Team US, uh, led by our Air Force branch chief and team manager, Marsha Stradaman, took over a few ambassadors over to Ukraine just just to help and get the program going and getting some things off the ground so that ally piece was crucial and we wanted to put that that was the most important part to go ahead and put on display for the world to see was that it's just not about team us it's about coming together as one unit one family and and bringing everyone closer together through sport i say sport is like music everybody can speak the same language in that way no matter what so we wanted to kind of draw that that parallel back from when we sent over some of our ambassadors. We sent Josh Smith and Brian Williams and Larry Franklin. We sent those guys over to help teach them basketball and track and all these other sports. And it was it was so exciting to bring it all back together again and just compete with our friends. One of the things that this pandemic has done is it's shown us all actually what's really important at its core and one of the things that's fantastic about Invictus it is the wrapper that it sits in it is the it's the bells the whistles the fantastic lights and everything but actually at its very heart it is a recovery tool for wounded injured and sick service men and women uh, and so you know that continued competition that continued sporting opportunity the, the continued recovery has been so important in this last two years probably more than ever it, it really has been is if you take a, a, a group of individuals that are already have you know certain struggles they're trying to they're trying to get past and they're trying to move through, and now you you put that on top of okay now you have to sit in your house you can't go anywhere you can't interact with people you know even if you take the idea of competition and throw it out the window it's like you you are now told that you have to disconnect so now again we have to get creative and say okay so we stop saying social distancing, and we call it physical distancing, because the social aspect is still very important and very crucial. So we actually stopped saying it's like, okay, it's not social distancing. This is about physical distancing, because the connection to others is what's important. And we move even beyond just doing competitions. We do virtual socials, virtual hangouts. We'll just hop on a Zoom or Microsoft Teams and just talk and, and chat and just stay together in that connectedness, because that was such a big piece that's missing when you join when you become a part of this world a lot of warriors involved in this community is like hey i'm in this alone right like it's just me and then when they get with their respective wounded warrior regiments they say hey you know what i'm not right like he understands what i'm going through she understands what i'm going through they understand what i'm going through and you feel so connected now and then here in february march 2020 said like just kidding now we have to kind of put everything on pause yeah. so you know zoom and microsoft teams and Streamyard has found ways to like you know what we can still stay connected so social distancing was something that we got rid of a long time ago fantastic well thank you so much for your time and thank you that is a wonderful way of looking at it and i am i'm absolutely going to take physical physical distancing forward with me i think that is yeah, uh, it shows you that language can be such a simple thing, but it can create barriers as well. So really important. Uh, well, moving to the Ukraine now, uh, and I'm delighted to introduce Oksana Horseback and Horback, sorry, and Victor. Uh, so I'm really sorry if this is not going to be right, and I'll, I'll let you correct me. Uh, Lego, uh, Le Kod 
Doka. No, that's terrible. That's terrible. I'll let you introduce yourself. I can see you grimacing at that at that horrible pronunciation there. But listen, let's let's pick up directly from what was being said there by Consuela. Uh, that amazing competition that happened between uh, that, that happened between the US and the Ukraine. I, I didn't even get who the winner was in it. So that tell us a little bit more about how that how, how that went down and how it helped you. So uh, with the beginning of the uh, pandemic uh, last year, uh, we felt this initial frustration, as I think every other nation felt, um, in terms of uh, being unable to assist your wounded, uh, injured or sick uh, warriors, and you would be unable to do what you wanted to do and what you wish to do and what you actually aimed to do. So our team was unable to provide the services and care that we uh, wanted to do. And uh, basically with all the gyms shut down and prohibition of gatherings, pretty much uh, everything was closed. So we were unable to do what we wanted to do. Uh, events, uh, psychological and physical rehabilitation events were not uh, accessible to us. So with uh, it was the United States to Ukraine virtual competition in rowing and powerlifting that made us realize that there were some untapped possibilities for the wounded warrior care uh, even during the pandemic so we've learned through this experience that online engagement in sports activities can be fun can be inspiring that virtual competition is still a meaningful human interaction and provides um, a feeling of community for our wounded warriors so we were very happy to participate in that event especially uh happy for our wounded warriors who were able again but for the first time since like march 2020 to feel the exciting moment of sport competition being able to put themselves out there again so numerous competitors would come back to me and say words of gratitude saying thank you for this online experience and uh, being really happy to be once again part of this a wonderful community and since then we have participated in the uh, united states online shooting competition british rowing competition london marathon and opportunities offered by we are invictus application in track and field swimming and others and it was wonderful right well i know you're going to translate for victor here but i would love to ask victor um how important has, has sport been um, not just through your recovery, but particularly in the last year or so throughout this pandemic. Uh, Victor, how uh, important for you was sport, not only during the whole last year, but also during your recovery after the wound? Sport in my life was always a це мій персональний наркотик. After the wound, I immediately, as I could, returned to playing sport. Від бурхових змаганнях до збірної України на іграх нескорених почав брати участь з першого року їх проведення. І тільки на третій рік прийшов у збірну. Впертість, підтримка та віра в себе допомагають. Sport has always been in my life. This is my personal drug. After the injury, I returned to sports as soon as I could. I started participating in the Invictus Games national trials the first year they were held. And only for the third year, I passed selection to the national team. So resilience, support of my family and strong will to win helped me to do it. And quickly then, how much is he looking forward to a year from now getting to compete in The Hague? Uh, наскільки ти чекаєш змагань та можливості побачити учасників з 20 націй Invictus? Наша команда була відібрана у 2019 році і вже два роки готується до змагань в Гаазі. Це психологічно непросто, однак наша команда за цей час стала одним цілим сім'єю. Ми змогли почати тренування з баскетболу на візках і вперше матимемо честь представляти Україну в командному виді спорту на іграх нескорених. Ми усі дуже чекаємо зустрічі з учасниками ігор нескорених в Гаазі, щоб відчути атмосферу ігор і стати частиною історії ігор нескорених. Uh, our team was selected in 2019 and has been preparing for the competition in the Hague for two years. It's ecologically difficult, but during this time, our team has become a whole and a family. So we were able to start training in wheelchair basketball and for the first time, we'll have the honor to present Ukraine in team sports at the Invictus Games in the Hague. We are all looking forward to meeting the participants of the Invictus Games, the Hague, to feel the atmosphere of the Games 
and become a part of the history uh, of the Invictus Games again. Fantastic. Well, I really can't wait to see Ukrainian team sports. And uh, I, I can't wait to meet, your, meet you guys as well come uh, in the Hague, in the flesh. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, moving to Italy now, uh, and we have uh, Giorgio Finelli, the psychologist uh, to the Italian team, uh, and also Pasquale Barrera, uh, who's the Italian team manager. Uh, I know you guys, uh, Giorgio in particular, have been doing a lot of surveying throughout the throughout the, the, the last couple of years and through the pandemic to get to get a real sense of the impact, the true impact of sport uh, on people's recovery uh, and just how important it is. Can you tell us some more about that? Okay, um, so the pandemic has completely changed the lifestyle. So psychological structure, social relationship and uh, the, the way the, the fitness also. It's uh, absolutely worth noting how much the pandemic has impacted people's lives, which also apply to the limitation in the practice of sports. In some cases, sport represents one of the tools people use to improve the quality of their life and uh, to access, to use to improve the, uh, the greater levels of satisfaction and well-being. In other cases, Sports are related to the identify of people, to the way in which they see themselves in relation to others. They are also related to the self-image, self-confidence, and are the main setting in which subjects socialize and interact and become affiliated. There is a third level also in which sports represent individual subjectivity. The entire subject's existence is reflected in the continuous sport practice. That is why it's impossible to separate a person's life from sports practice. The person says what he, she does through sports. So the impact depends on how sport is important in the life of the person. Um, that Pasquale, I mean, uh, you have seen that not you know this data has been gathered but you've seen the first that that first hand essentially haven't you through your lived experience yes uh, i am uh, the team manager in italy uh, i am the head of the paralympic and sport uh, hspd sport activity section the um, defense general staff this is the the, the gspd uh, that uh, uh, which have a video that i please uh, ask to show uh, stand for uh, Defense Paralympic Sporting Group. This is a project uh, that to, in Italy we, we, we began from the 2014. Uh, this project is dedicated to the defense uh, personnel who during the service served permanent and validating the injury uh, or experienced a traumatic uh, event directly. Many of them continue to serve wearing the uniform and uh, with their needs and their story it represent a clear example um, of recovery through sport. As you can see in the video, uh, we practice different discipline. At the time of its establishment, uh, 14 members composed the GSPD. Now we are 67, uh, of which 39 military service, uh, 16 civilian of the military of defense, former military, and 12 retired. The member of the uh, group uh, over time have had the very important positive changes in terms uh, of acceptance of their bodies and their uh, social skills. The work done by the GSPD and the Victus Games, of course, have been fundamental for many of them in returning to having a peaceful life uh, made up of sport, work and family. That personally, I think uh, there are three fundamental elements to fill uh, 306 degrees uh, uh, NLT person. Okay, the video is going to finish. So I can say that uh, in Italy, uh, since 2014, as I said before, the, the first addiction of, of in the Victus in London, we 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 follow our, our soldier uh, with this project that is based on the sports. And uh, as so Giorgio said before. Uh, it depends how you live the sport and how much you practice, but uh, is uh, is for sure that uh, this kind of uh, uh, of um, 
using the sport as a rehabilitation is one of the, 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 the most important uh, elements to, to, to gain uh, the possibility to come back in a good health and good mind. Thank you so much. And uh, we're saying Pascal has, has a bronze medal himself from those games back in 2014 as well. Uh, thank you yeah. so much, guys. All right, well, picking up straight in Hawaii then. By the way, three o'clock in the morning in Hawaii, I might say. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, can I say a, a massive welcome uh, to, to Garrett and Joey Kawada. Um, first of all, how are things in Hawaii? Why don't we start with that? <laughs> Uh, thanks. It's good to be here. Uh, it's been pretty warm the last few days. It's nice and sunny. Oh, wow. Everything you would imagine. Yes, but the sun is not shining at the moment. Uh, I'm no, not, not the yet. The night. <laughs> um, wow. I mean, how has the last year been for you in particular? And I mean, you've been on a serious journey yourself, Garrett. But you know, how has the how has the the the, the last year been in particular? Uh, it's made me come up with creative ways to keep working out with the gym shutting down and things like that. It just showed me that I don't actually need a gym to, to continue to train. I've come up with, uh, made my own roller for my bike. Come up with different ways to throw a shot put. I hooked up the shot to a, a fishing pole so I don't have to chase it. I can just reel it back to me. Just creative ways. It gives me a lot of time to, to think about things <laughs> and come up with new ways to train. Well, that's the thing we've always, uh, you know, as, as soldiers and as athletes, particularly through Invictus, we have had to improvise, adapt and overcome no much more th than in the last year. Um, but, you know, taking it right back, I mean, how, how important has Invictus been in, in your life, not just your recovery, I would say? As yeah, sport is, it's, uh, it's, Sport itself, it just it, it saved my life, basically. I, after my injuries, I, I kept trying to recover, or I kept thinking I would get back to my norm or my healthy self or my normal self or old self, whatever you want to call it. And it wasn't happening, and, and I just got really depressed. And I was introduced to adaptive sports through the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program and Coach Connie and, and, and Marcia Strauderman. And it just completely turned my life around. It showed me that I was able to continue to compete at high levels. And I was able to continue to compete in sports and do activities that I, I once enjoyed. And it's just kept me going. And it, it really got me through this, this time where everything's been shut down. I was still able to continue to you know, swim. I could I go into the ocean since we live in Hawaii. All the pools are shut down, but I'd still go in the ocean and swim. I've recumbent bike and, and enjoy the the lack of, of traffic that we have because the, we had, you know, a lot less tourists here. So the roads were clearer. Yeah, it, it kept me going, kept me sane. <laughs> wow. So water on all sides. We, we, we're an island as well here in the UK, but we don't get to go. I certainly would be jumping in the ocean in a hurry. Um, but Joey, as a wife, we know that, that, that the families are just a cornerstone of the Invictus community. We know that they're a cornerstone of, of any veteran. Um, but how important has it been, has, has sport, has the Invictus Games been in, in seeing you know, the rediscovery, I don't know, it, it, he said it there, in saving his life, essentially. Yeah, it has been a, um, a major, sport has been a major thing for us. I mean, that's that's how we met almost 30 years ago was through sport. We were both playing volleyball. So it's been the foundation of our lives. All of our boys um, played sport. And so uh, when he thought that his sports career might be over or, or even his outdoor activities might be over, it, it was a huge blow. So um making the um uh warrior games team and then being selected for invictus games team that really gave him um self-confidence and um and when he's happy doing sport and something that he loves um that makes me happy when, when he's doing that it's less for me to worry about so sport literally like garrett said um saved his life and um 
yeah, got us all to our happy place again. And that, that's the thing I'd love to hear just a bit more about. I mean, you keep, you know, we all talk, yeah, about the impact it's had on him, but what impact has it had on you? Um, just seeing him um, doing sport and, and keeping himself busy with that, um, I mean, that, that is the impact it makes me, makes me proud that he's, he's doing what he loves and um, I'm able to see him grow and I'm able to see, um, yeah, I'm able to see us um, thriving and moving forward um, and, and sports is a, is a huge part of that. Well, thank you so much for, for getting up in the middle of the night and letting us uh, just see a little glimpse of Hawaii. I'm sure if you open that window, it's just dark, but even just seeing the lilies over your shoulders, it's so lovely. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and who knows, maybe we'll all get to come to Hawaii one day. Uh, and I'll be able to see there. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, now we're going to head uh, to Georgia, uh, hopefully. Um, and I'm delighted to say, are we joined now by Stati? Yes. Uh, really. There we are. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you're the psychologist oh, uh, um, for a, a, a psychologist in, in Georgia, um, a member of the psychological division uh, of the MOD, the Ministry of Defence in Georgia. Uh, yes. Sir. Kind of picking up on, on on some of the research that we, we've already heard from Italy. I, I mean, but I mean, we all know about the physical impact that these sports have, but tell us more about the psychological impact because that's what that's the thing that's, that people have really struggled with in the last year in particular. Uh, uh, I agree because uh, the pandemic uh, was uh, everyone uh, during this pandemic and uh, because of this challenge uh, we at the psychological support division we uh, developed a program uh, of psychological resilience for uh, service persons uh, in public security service like uh, for soldiers, for police, for uh, uh, rescue workers, for all those employees who are working in the public security service. And uh, the aim of this training was to uh, teach people how to improve and maintain psychological well-being during this pandemic. And uh, how to build the skills needed, psychological skills and needed to develop this uh, resilience. How how to use these skills in daily life. Uh, uh, how to manage the irrational thoughts and maladaptive emotions, uh, and uh, develop useful coping strategies. Because this this pandemic has been a struggle, which. We would we would wish on nobody, just in the same way that many of the the wounded, injured, and sick have have you know myself included have have had, have had injuries or, or sickness that no one would wish on anyone. But it, it does develop resilience, being able to survive it, being able to live through it. So in the last year in particular, it has been a unique opportunity to de to develop, um, as you say, coping strategies and, and a new form of resilience, essentially. Yes, uh, and uh, wounded soldiers have uh, seen the worst cases of uh, what extreme stress is, right? Uh, so uh, having such experience on their shoulders, we included two wounded uh, military service members uh, who were uh, severely injured during the peacekeeping operations. Uh, as a, We invited them as co-trainers during this online trainings and uh, later uh, in the face to face trainings and they um, were acting like co-trainers uh, assistants of the training and the um, training was very important for several reasons uh, like uh, they they uh, acquired new skills like to be uh, to have uh, representational skills like to deliver their own experience uh, in understandable manner to to be able to explain things uh, uh, to the huge audience uh, and they never ha had a meeting with such a amount of audience before 
uh, and also they uh, demonstrated how to uh, keep active life despite being severely injured um, and also um, they were able to like um, with this introspection uh, they become uh, more aware of what they uh, feel and how to cope with these uh, stressors um, in the future we also uh, plan to involve even more injured uh, service persons in such kind of trainings and not not only resilience training there are other trainings that can lead to um, increasing physical services in a military field that's fantastic it's really brilliant to hear there that the sort of mutual learning you know the development of you know of 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 individual skills as well as um you know a benefit to to a greater good which ultimately it embodies what we do as service personnel that idea of service and it is absolutely at the heart of what the invictus games is about well yeah, thank you very yeah. much everyone oh sorry no pick up on that please if you want if you want we've got two minutes uh you you might. uh yes it's it's uh, um uh, the uh, process of developing this training course, uh, we um, we had assistance uh, like uh, from U.S. Walter Reed Army Research Institute. They provided us with the materials, uh, and uh, uh, we are grateful for this opportunity. And uh, uh, but I I want to mention that wounded soldiers uh, also in uh, vision of. Uh, uh, stress because they have a unique uh, experience uh, and uh, you know uh, we found it uh, very interesting that they communicate uh, uh, with the uh, military personnel in a different channel uh, like uh, uh, and uh, they have m m more power to deliver this information and uh, uh, the people believe them uh, and trust them more because uh, they are from the same uh, field, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's that it's, it's that lived experience that, that yes. um, you know, as you say, that's the Credibil resilience that, that uh, exists. Credibility was high. Credibility. Absolutely, absolutely. And as you say, that that lived experience that well, you can't you can't get it in a textbook is what, is yeah, what I would say. <laughs> civilian background, it's. Uh, uh, a little bit difficult to mm -hmm. uh, to to replicate the same results as they do, and they did a great job. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, and thank you everyone that's been on our wonderful world tour uh, uh, across session one. Um, so yeah, swiftly moving on, uh, we're going to keep moving along because we've got some more fantastic contributors uh, to come along uh, as we move into coping with adversity uh, and building back better in session two. Well, welcome to session two, coping with adversity and building back better. Now, it is my uh, great privilege to introduce Professor Neil Greenberg for this. Now, um, Neil, I, 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 I don't want to be rude. I'm, I'm going to get you to introduce yourself, actually, if that's all right, because you're a man with many letters after your name, essentially. But there's so much more to you than that, because it's, you know, you've had a 23-year military career, um, and, and all those letters after your name have been... Have been um, have been earned and learnt through real hands-on experiences, unique experiences, but, uh, you know, they, there's a real passion to the work that you do. Uh, and the, the, you know, the, you've, you know, from, from what I've heard of you in the past and from those that, you know, mutual friends we have, there's a real, you really care for want of a better word. Um, so I, I would love if you could just by, to start by sort of introducing yourself and giving us an idea of the experiences that you've had that have led you um, to be the man that you are, that have the experience, you know, the, 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 the qualities that you do and therefore, or well, like we just said there, the credibility that you bring to it essentially. 
Thanks very much, JJ. Um, so um, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist um, at the moment. Um, I have been for many, many years now. Um, I served in the Navy for 23 years and was lucky enough to do my commando training and serve alongside um, people like JJ who wore nice uh, green colored hats. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, organizations that place people into predictably really challenging situations. So that was my interest in being in the military. And I've, I've been lucky enough to work with emergency services and diplomats and media professionals. And over the last year and a, and a bit now, I've, I've been really, really lucky to, to work closely uh, with uh, many, many NHS staff, uh, particularly NHS uh, England and Improvement. And you're going to hear some more uh, from those uh, a bit later on. And I guess my interest is how do you help people who are doing a really tough job to keep going when things are tough because that's clearly uh, good for them and it's obviously good for whatever the uh, output is that they're trying to achieve you know in this case over the last 15 months you know saving lives and uh, preventing people um, from from having um, sort of horrible experiences um so unlike uh, your previous uh, talkers who have been um, chatting away i've got some slides i wonder if they could be brought up for me that that's great um, and um, what I'm going to do is to talk through these slides um, just to kind of let you know um, what my views are on this important topic. And for those of you who are into Twitter, uh, you can see my Twitter handle there. I do try and put out uh, the research that we uh, publish on, on a regular basis through Twitter. Um, so over the last uh, 15 months or so, there's been no doubt at all that there's been a lot of uh, traumatic exposure going on out there. Uh, and people have been working, as we know, you know, in, in very strange ways. Um, I've heard it said it's not so much working from home uh, so much as sleeping in the office. And I think that's been true for lots of people. And of course, in our home lives, you know, across the globe, we've, we've been affected by you know, bereavement, uh, by difficulties with children and you know, financial difficulties, as well as changes to our lifestyle. But there's a particular topic that has come up many, many times, particularly in relation to healthcare workers. But this topic started you know, in, the, in the military some, some years back, and that's this topic of moral injury. And what moral injury is, is a situation in which you're put into uh, where uh, your moral or ethical code has been strongly violated. Um, and it occurs along a spectrum. So many of us have moral dilemmas and moral distress. Some of us, unfortunately, develop moral injury um, and and some of us then go on to become unwell. And the three main ways that moral injury can occur is, is by things that happen, either things that I've done or other people have done around me things I didn't do when I, I really felt that I should have done and, and also feeling betrayed. And you know, at the heart of the last 15 months of, of many healthcare workers' uh, lives, but, but many of us, not just healthcare workers as well, has been that I really want to do a good job, but actually I, I just can't do it. I've been prevented from doing it. The situation has made it impossible. And that puts us into this horrible dilemma where we feel strong anger or guilt or shame. Um, and that is at the heart of what a moral injury is. When we look at moral injury scientifically and, you know, us boffin types enjoy our science, we find that there's a very strong link with um, with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, with depression. And also, um, unfortunately, there's a small but significant link also with, with suicidality as well. Um, and th this is a really important topic because when we look at it in healthcare workers, we find it, um, people who have moral injury um, experiences are much more likely to have poor mental health. And so this is actually uh, looking at three, four different ways of, of looking at mental health. I, I won't go into the detail of them, but they're depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress. And we split morally injurious events into, into low, medium and high. And what you can see here is this, this is the percentage of people who, um, who, 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 who probably have a mental health disorder. Uh, or at least lots of symptoms of mental health disorder. And you can see this group here with the highest level of exposure to morally injurious events, uh, you know, not being able to do what I wanted to do, seeing things that were wrong, feeling let down. They're the ones that had um, the most likelihood of, of suffering with, with mental health difficulties. So this is a really important topic in, in healthcare workers. This is a study we've been doing um, over um, the last year and a bit now, uh, looking at just intensive care staff. And what this um, shows you here is this is back in June last year and here's February this year. And you don't worry so much about what the percentages are. These are different ways of looking at traumatic stress. But the reason I put this graph up is it shows that actually, you know, sort of in June last year, the rates of high levels of, of traumatic stress were high as things got better. So the situation improved, the symptoms went down. 
expectant. And then what happened is that uh, when things began to get bad again with the second wave, then actually um, people's symptoms reported. So the good news here, if there is good news, is that although there's a large amount of um, healthcare staff who are reporting symptoms, as things get better, and let's hope they continue to do so now, we expect to see a lot of recovery naturally, um, because that's what people do. They have a lot of symptoms. And then as the situation improves, so does their, their mental health. So what can you do to um, really support staff who are doing difficult tasks? Well, one of the things we know makes a really big difference is by supporting each other. And this is a study we did, did a number of years now ago. It's um, uh, of military peacekeepers who are, uh, were in the former Yugoslavia. So they were doing peacekeeping operations. And it won't surprise you to know that peacekeepers who spoke to each other and to other people about their experiences did better than those who didn't. But when we asked, who did you speak to? 97% of people told us that they spoke to people just like them, who had been on the same operation, who walked in their shoes, who spoke the same language. And actually only 8% spoke to medical or welfare staff. So what this tells us is actually the best sort of support initially comes from people around you who really understand your experiences and what you've been through. However, the biggest impact we know uh, in terms of mental health support at work comes from someone's relationship with their immediate supervisor. And what we really want are supervisors who can have what we call a psychologically savvy chat. You know, um, my our US colleagues have a nice phrase for this, which is they need to be able to do a checkup from the neck up. So it's a bit of a cheesy phrase, but it sort of tells you what they need to do. And there's really good evidence when we look at this, that in both military personnel and also in firefighters, great study done in Australia, if you've got a supervisor who can really look out for your mental well-being and talk to you about it, that can lead to a 90 percent reduction in symptoms or in sickness absence costs. So reducing things by 90 percent, reducing symptoms by 90 percent is really something that we are, are going to be keen on because that's decidedly a good thing. And it's worth saying that this this is good evidence as well. So this is not just a, a couple of little studies. There's good evidence that a good relationship with your supervisor makes a really, really important difference. So on the basis of that, we designed an intervention called REACT, which was a simple active listening skills package for supervisors, um, um, started in the London Nightingale Hospital, where uh, I, I was working last year and um, back in uh, April and May. And this was a one hour training package we delivered over Zoom, um, about 15 minutes of um, sort of telling people what to do or giving them some information, five minutes or so of a demonstration and then getting people practicing. And REACT stands for recognize, engage, actively listen, check risk and talk about a specific plan. And it's a simple structured way of trying to help supervisors feel confident to have those psychological well-meaning conversations. We did a small pilot study here looking at what was the impact of REACT. Uh, and we found that before supervisors went on the course, over half of them didn't feel confident to support their colleagues um, uh, in relation to their mental health. But one month afterwards, nearly 85 percent felt confident. So this is a one hour bite sized um, intervention uh, training course. And that had a really important uh, impact on supervisors confidence to speak about these um, mental health issues. So you know, that it doesn't mean what this means is we don't have to necessarily have complicated ways of trying to improve well-being at work. Another thing we know makes a really big difference is peer support. And uh, one of the ways that peer support um, is done, and this started in the British military, in, in the Royal Marines, I'm pleased to say, was, was putting in place a peer support package that didn't rely on experts, but instead we trained up uh, Marines how to speak to Marines about mental health issues. And that's kind of where it started. Uh, and this um, process was called TRIM, Trauma Risk Management. Um, and the good news about TRIM is we've done 13 scientific studies on TRIM now. Um, and TRIM is not penicillin for trauma, so it doesn't prevent people becoming unwell, uh, because unfortunately we don't know yet how to, how to do that. We don't know how to prevent people from being affected by trauma, although we've got some ideas. But what TRIM does is a way of actively monitoring um, staff who have been exposed to traumatic stress and then making sure that if they have difficulties, they are assisted to get professional help. And there's over 50 NHS trusts now that are using TRIM in some ways and 15 ambulance trusts uh, as well uh, across the UK. Um, and what this shows together, the evidence is that this is a effective way of identifying people who have got mental health difficulties in the workplace. 
um, supporting them in reducing their sickness absence, and then importantly, getting the people who need additional support to get to professional help. Because unfortunately, we know that no matter whether you're the military or healthcare worker, or whether you're just in society, you know, across the world, many people with mental health difficulties don't go and get the help that they need. So, so this sort of system of having your buddies and peers and supervisors being able to talk to you about mental health is really important. One thing you shouldn't be doing though, um, and this is our UK National Institute for Health and Care Excellence guidelines, is you should not be doing what's called psychological debriefing. So it's great to have mental health professionals around. We can do a really uh, useful job in supporting people who are, who are unfortunately are unwell, who have developed a mental health problem. But what you do not want to be doing is to be relying on mental health experts to come into a workplace, be that a healthcare setting or be that the military or anywhere else, to try and make things better after a traumatic event. This, this idea of trauma counselling or psychological debriefing, it might sound attractive in the short term, um, but actually it, it, it's not a good idea. Um, and what happens is, is that actually you can end up making things worse. What um, we do know in the workplace is that if you've got people who are distressed, that there is a really nice, simple approach called PIES that can make a big difference to keeping people at work and doing well. Um, and uh, what PIES stands for is proximity, immediacy, expectancy and simplicity. Uh, I'll run through what they mean in a second. But this is a study done in the uh, American Journal of Psychiatry a few years ago now. And this was showed that in the Israeli military after the first Lebanon war, which was 1982, um, that the troops who developed stress reactions, unfortunately, um, that the more the PIES principles put in place, the better they were um, 20 years later on. So that's a really useful long term study. So proximity means if someone's having a tough time, keep them uh, in the workplace, give them more support, temporarily reduce or change their duties, but don't just send them home. Immediacy says that if someone's got a difficulty, have a proper, decent, psychologically uh, well-being focused conversation with them, nip it in the bud and prevent it from going on to become a serious difficulty, um, which then unfortunately becomes a crisis much of the time. So nip things in the bud. Expectancy says that actually if they've got some symptoms, then just like I showed you in that intensive care graph earlier on, most symptoms will recover over time as the situation recovers. So you can reassure them that things are likely to get better. But that's a, the other side to expectancy is that if things don't get better, then what we should be doing is to make sure they get professional help. And then the last piece is about simplicity. And what simplicity says is if someone's having a real difficulty, simple solutions often make a huge difference. So if you've got a member of staff who's really worried about a particular procedure that they're not sure about or a particular piece of equipment they're not confident to use, they don't need to see a mental health professional about their anxiety. They need a colleague or a supervisor to mentor them to use that piece of equipment better because that will reduce their anxiety. So simple things make a really big difference. And then we come on to the period that hopefully we're in now, which is this recovery and evolution period. I don't just like using the term recovery because I think that actually we don't, in the healthcare service anyway, just want to get back to where we were. We want to actually get to a better place where staff well-being is at the core of what happens um, as, a, as, as a matter of course. So how can you encourage people to, to, to improve themselves? And the key thing here isn't just avoiding people becoming unwell, it's also trying to promote what's called post-traumatic growth, which is this idea that anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So the aim here is if we get this piece right, this recovery and evolution period piece right, then actually we won't just come out of it and think, gosh, that was lucky. We, you know, we avoided mental health difficulties. We will come out, with, out, out of it with a more resilient workforce that's better placed um, to go forward in the future. So give people a proper thank you. Tell them about all the support that's available. Send them back to work in a graded way. Don't just put them straight back into catching up with all those um, really challenging uh, waiting lists that are out there. And then we come back to this concept about moral injury. And the, the core of a moral injury is the fact is that something just doesn't make sense. And so what that means is that actually we need to help people try and do what's called meaning making. Um, and the way to do this is to have uh, conversations, ideally as a team, ideally led by the, the boss, the supervisor, the leader, to talk about the facts, the impact, how people are now and to give some education. And it's this impact piece that's most important, not just what happened, but what impact did that have on me? What did that make me think? What did that make me behave? What did that make me feel? And we're aiming here to create what's called a meaningful narrative, which is a story 
Um, that doesn't end up with it was all my fault. It doesn't end up with it's all the fault of my boss. It ends up with this good concept, which is although we weren't always in the same boat, we were absolutely in the same storm. And the idea here is to try and make people understand that actually we were all in it together. And then importantly, um, we want supervisors to carry on chatting to their staff to find out what happened to them, not just at work, but also in their home life. How will you know about bereavement, you know, family difficulties, educational difficulties, unless you have these discussions. So everyone should be having, I know it sounds strange, a return to work interview, which is what's happened to you over the last year and a bit. And actually, what can we do to flexibly support you as we go forward? Last last couple of bits here is keep an eye on people uh, and this because problems won't just come out um, straight away. Um, and then make sure that if they become unwell, get them the right sort of care, the right sort of treatment, because there's some really good evidence based treatments out there. So just the end of my talk in my conclusion is we shouldn't over medicalize normal distress. There's a lot of distress out there. We want to try and nip things in the bud early on and have those well-meaning conversations with colleagues and importantly with supervisors. Manage acute distress in the workplace wherever possible and make sure you have a recovery and evolution plan because get this bit right, support people properly now, even if everything before wasn't as we would have wanted, then actually in the longer term, we're gonna have a more resilient workforce that is ready to deal with whatever comes next. Thanks very much indeed. That's, uh, that's my um, presentation bit done. Neil, thank you so much. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear you explain things so clearly and to use facts and figures because whilst mental health is such an emotive topic sometimes in amongst that noise we can lose the true scale of it uh, and it's you know it's really really helpful to hear it uh, from yourself and i'm a big big believer in post-traumatic growth I, I think this is something which lots of people are ultimately discovering it now many of us from the invictus family have have uh, uh, you know show that and have, have lived it many people are i think are now beginning to experience it as a result of the pandemic so thank you very much for your time uh, and for your knowledge um so moving on uh, into our final discussion and this is one that i'm particularly excited about so just bear with us as we head into session three Welcome to session three, sharing the Invictus spirit. Uh, support from the Invictus Games Foundation to England's National Health Service. Um, this is this is something which I'm very honoured to have been uh, just you know uh, involved with a little bit uh, in the last year myself, which I can get into uh, in a moment. Um, but. Before we introduce our fantastic um, contributors for this, I'd like to also invite Dominic Reed back to the fold, um, the CEO of the Invictus Games Foundation, to give a, a, an oversight uh, and an insight to the work that has been done between the IGF and the NHS. The, um, no, it, the sharing the Invictus spirit has always been one of the things that I know um, Prince Harry has been very, very keen on. Is how do you bottle this extraordinary quality, this survivability, the post-traumatic growth, the ability to move beyond, all of those positive things, how do you bottle that and make that available to other people? And it's always been difficult to search out there in the mist beyond the Invictus Games to find out where where that could, could start and where it could be applied. And we were very fortunate that uh, through uh, M. Wilkinson Bryce, who's going to join us in a minute, and and, and others in the NHS, um, we, we started to investigate how we could actually do that. And we've done a couple of things. Um, we've been involved in in um, developing a series of, of podcasts, which are specifically targeted at the sort of issues that people who have been frontline uh, in the front line as healthcare workers. What's the commonality between their experience and, and the sort of experiences of the, of the Invictus cohort? And, and can we offer something that means people don't have to learn it the hard way all over again? I mean, life is a path that you have to tread yourself, obviously, but can, what, what support can we provide? And I think we, we've, we've targeted a, a series of quite careful and quite dis discreet issues and, 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 and made a contribution there, which is fantastic. Um, the other thing that, that, that has been... Um, useful and very eye-opening for me is that I was asked to join the Wellbeing and Recovery Commission of the NHS. So um, I've been part of that uh, since its inception. And, and whilst there are some extremely erudite and learned people there with, with deep skill um, on the issues of, of, of 
workforce resilience and, and how to how to deal with it. and also very deep knowledge of how the NHS structures all work. Um, we have been able to play a part in that too and I think that's the beginning of something extremely exciting. I think there is um, a, an opportunity for the NHS to learn from us, albeit we're tiny, they're huge, um, but also it's a great opportunity for us to be able to learn how to spread our message because I think it's a very important message and, and heaven knows the world in all sorts of places needs it more than ever. So, so um, looking forward very much to welcoming uh, M. Wilkinson, Bryce, and, and Claire Parker, and Steve Lee, and others uh, to the to the floor. JJ. Yes. Well, at this point, uh, we'd like to introduce them. Uh, thank you for your introductions, uh, M. Wilkinson, Bryce, as you heard there. Um, I, I'd love to start with yourself. I, I, I will start this actually by saying that my my sister uh, is a nurse. She's been working um, running a COVID ward essentially, um, you know, since day one of this pandemic. And I remember speaking to her heading into this. And I, I, I'm really I'm not over making this overly dramatic. I remember the conversation I had with her. There was a real sense of particularly the anticipation of what was about to come as as they braced for that first wave. Um, and the manner in which she was wrestling with that felt very like myself when I deployed to Afghanistan 10 years ago. Um, and so, you know, the, that, the media threw around the sort of the term of, you know, that, that we're on a war footing and, you know, we're, we're facing this front line of this battle and this pandemic. But my understanding that was that was pretty pretty realistic and, and hence why this partnership has developed. Can you just start by giving us a sense of, 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 of the struggles the day-to-day -day challenges that were being faced by, by those working on our front line during this pandemic. Yeah, thank you. And um, Dominic, it's great um, to have been invited to, to join this session. So thank you very much. Um, so what was it like out there? I mean, you know, we, we work in NHS England. Um, up until 18 months ago, I was um, a chief nurse in an organisation and have been in the NHS for 32 years. Nothing prepared anybody for what this for what happened with with COVID. Um, and I think what we learned very early on was we really needed to listen. We needed to listen really, really carefully and closely to what staff were telling us. And uh, people were scared. People were scared. You know, the NHS operates on an evidence based. Um, kind of world and there wasn't an evidence base we couldn't look at what was going to happen next so everything we were doing about trying to support staff was about trying to get people ready for what might come next and looking internationally globally at what was happening in other countries and the reason that I think we were so motivated to create the partnership that we have with not just the Invictus um, Foundation but also with other partners so we've partnered with um, Hospice UK, we've partnered with the Samaritans, because this was going to affect everybody. In some way, this was going to affect everybody. And healthcare professionals are the worst at accessing help for themselves. Um, they always put everybody else first and it's them last. So trying to create something that would be available for everybody and actually to say, it's not a case of if you need help, we heard from some people well that would make me weak and actually what we've really learned from some of the conversations with um with with you guys is do you know what it, it this is it's going to be inevitable that we're all going to need some form of support at some point um and the recovery commission that dominic mentioned is made up of an incredible array of experts people who've dealt with um, colleagues from the military people who've dealt with things like the ebola crisis the manchester bombing um as well as occupational psychology um and and, uh, and uh, uh, other mental health experts such as Neil. So it it's meant that we tried to get people ready for what they would experience. We've tried to really support people with a really holistic sense of what health and well-being is. And I think, you know, that that we know that health and well-being means different things to different people. We know that um, this could take years for people to process what they've been through. It's not like we're going to have a point in time when it's done. Um, and I think for me, the enduring legacy that we would love to see happen across the NHS is there's been a real light shone on health and well-being in a way that perhaps was a long time coming. And, and you know, we're all really committed that that's not going to change. It's going to continue. And that's a really important thing to end on and, and, and brings me nicely to my next question, which is, you know, a lot of this has been we've been on the back foot and we're trying to create the best resource for the here and the now. 
but there is already an eye on the future and what can be put in place. And again, this building back better, this what can we le learn from the resilience? So what, what do things look like for the future in terms of you know, the frameworks? So I'll, I'll say a little bit, but then I'm going to ask Steve to come in because Steve Perfect. works as part of the team and he's the head of health and wellbeing and he's very much got his eye on the future. Um, so I think we have, um, we've learnt that things have to be individualised. Um, we've learnt that uh, there's a great phrase that one of our national directors uses, which is resilience resides in teams. So very much reflecting on what Neil said and what I've learned from the way the Invictus works. You know, this is about a sense of community, a sense of team. Teams are what make the NHS work. Um, so um, that's that's the best way I can describe the kind of what have we learned. What we've also learned is that through COVID, it really um, shone a light on that disproportionate impact on our BAME colleagues, it, both BAME colleagues and BAME um, communities. So really needing to understand what works for um, diverse uh, parts of our population and parts of our community. But we were in react mode. We were in react mode. So, Steve, let me ask you to say a little bit about what we're looking at for the future. Sure. Thanks, Sam. And, and thank you for, for inviting us along today. And it's, it's been fantastic working with the Invictus Games Foundation, particularly on promoting our physical health offer, because it's um, it's very much seen as not being an in, instruction in the centre, but as a, as a partnership that we've built with you. And sharing those stories has been been hugely invaluable through things such as the podcast. In terms of our eyes to the future, I think it's really important for us to ensure, as Em said, that the offer is sustain sustainable and that health and well-being isn't just seen as something that we're putting in place during uh, the height of the pandemic, but something that we we cherish, that we'll be pursuing in future months and years, and kind of will become kind of a hallmark of what you can expect to, to, to see within the NHS as an employer. Um, to help with that, there's three main elements of our strategy going forward for, for the coming year. Uh, the first element is around health and well-being guardians. Those guardians, typically in large organisations, will be non-executive director level who will be able to provide that sponsorship and oversight of health and well-being activities. And to support those guardians, we've been working with other partner organisations such as the Health and Safety Executive to, to look at both lead and lag indicators of performance. By which I mean, you know, typically we've been looking at lag indicators, sickness substance, for example, or vacancy rates. Whereas we're saying, well, what can organisations do to get ahead of the curve? What can they put in place to look at those preventative arrangements to ensure that people don't go off sick in the first place? The second element is around health and wellbeing conversations. And health and wellbeing conversations should be happening already across the NHS. And they're a really dynamic, compassionate approach between your line manager or your teams to check in, to see how you are on, on a daily or routine basis not a numbers game so we just want people to kind of say how are you and to really listen and to again we see how physical health can really be part of that conversation piece and we know from talking to colleagues who have got back into that physical health uh, kind of space if you like that it's really it's really helped them in terms of building back teams and building back that sense of of normality the third strategic priority is around occupational health and ensuring that occupational health provides intelligence to support the preventative agenda, but also helps to promote physical health and, and healthy lifestyles. So we see those three kind of strands of the work, which again have been helpfully informed by, by colleagues on the Recovery Commission, can help us to go a long way, particularly in promoting physical health, but also around this agenda of prevention, while kind of sharing the art of the possible, we know there have been some pockets of fantastic performance and we're keen to galvanise those and, and push on from here. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. And, and you know, it, it's it's brilliant to see that, that there is, uh, you know, a resilience forum and, and so much in the pipeline. Um, but I also, and, and it's worth just saying at this point, is thank you very much for all the incredible work that you've done for us all in, in this last year in particular. Um, I... You know, as, as as Em said at the very beginning, no one could predict that. You know that nothing readies you for this. So we are extremely grateful for the hours and the hard work that you've put in. Zoe, I, I would I would love to just um, you know go back to where we were at the beginning and get uh, just a real sense of you know what it has been like for, uh, uh, you know physically on the front line. 
Which I think you are there right now, but it looks stuff. I mean. No, it does look like I am. <laughs> so I was um, deployed right at the heart of incident response for COVID, so making a lot of quite significant decisions and, you know, just the disruption that we felt and the intense pressure and stress on a daily basis. I've never known anything like it. And I think thinking about how people were when they went into COVID, I'd had a bereavement and the relationship had ended. I'd moved house, I had insecure accommodation. So... You know, I wasn't actually even going into COVID in a good place. It was just kind of issues compounded. Um, I'm also a single mum with four children. So they were obviously going through it themselves across four different educational settings. Just the admin burden. You know, I think when we look at long COVID and some of the knowledge from that, the um, decline in executive function was a phrase that's been used and it really resonates with me. I just reach a capacity and then, you know, I can't do anything beyond that limit that I have. Um, but what's been so good is the health and wellbeing conversations have been so useful. There's such a genuine love and a genuine need to connect between people and to genuinely care about how people are. There's some very complex situations, you know, not just in the workplace, but also in people's home lives. And it just requires such a sensitive touch to empower people to get it right for themselves. And I really do think the conversations go a long way to that and the strength of the leaders. Um, and also for me, the recent initiative of um, 5K Our Way was something, it was um, an ask to come forward and to do some exercise and to just recuperate and recover and restore with some physical activity. And it was so accessible to me. It really, I've done sportives before, I've done 10Ks. I was in no condition to do anything of that magnitude, but the wellness and the fitness thing was a great thing for me to hear that, you know, yes, we want you to do this. We want you to commit to this as, you know, kind of part of Team NHS, which was great. So um, I got out, did some walking, which was a great time to, you know, reset and process and think about what had happened. You know, obviously music comes into it as well, listening to a soundtrack just to sort of decompress and just let stress out at the end of the day. Um, and for me, um, that initiative was a way to just finish my work day and start my family day because I found it really difficult to switch, you know, kind of from one to the other. So that's, you know, a, a, the, the well-being conversations plus the invite to consider, you know, your physical activity and how nurturing and restorative that was was really welcome to me. Brilliant. So just a quick reminder that the 5K Our Way was, was an initiative which is just finished there on the 29th of May. It's kind of like the couch to 5K, so it's been fantastic to see people replay the physical but also the mental benefits of being involved in exercise. Uh, the podcast series, The Conversation, hosted by Michael Coates, um, is available on all good uh, podcast platforms uh, covering uh, subjects from uh, re uh, reconnecting with the family, dealing with difficulty, uh, with difficult decisions uh, and uh, experiences, the importance of teams and networks. That's a particularly good one. They interview a really nice guy on that one. Uh, the power of sport in recovery and rehabilitation. Uh, Dave Henson I'm talking about. He's really nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, pre and preparing for a second deployment uh, in military terms, but the second surge that we obviously were talking about uh, at the time when it was recorded uh, and the internal dimension. So that's that the resource is still there uh, and I would highly recommend listening to it. some really really brilliant uh, experiences that are so honestly shared um, I, I, I would like to go back very quickly so with with I mean you said that you came into this pandemic in a pretty bad place and you've obviously been through an extremely mm. tough year C can I ask how you are now you know you seem in very good spirits and as if you know things yeah. like the, the, the 5k away has made a big difference it has made a big difference and I do feel supported. And what's really interesting is I think previously I would think of my mental health and physical health as kind of linear and it would flow like this, whereas it feels at the moment like there's kind of two versions of me. There's a slightly worried, you know, how surreal everything was. Did I make the right decisions? And then there's, I'm always genuinely quite happy because we got through a pandemic. I know, you know, it's great to be there and support other people. And I kind of flip across between the two. Um, so it's quite important to understand that you can have, I think, you know, concurrent but opposing experiences, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I don't know, it sounds like I'm kind of split personality, but obviously you have your professional self, your home self. Um, yourself with friends and I'm quite different in all of those scenarios and I think what I've learned is that you know people around me care there's so many resources and there's so many people with such great advice to offer 
that I can express those different parts of myself and be heard and understood. And I think that's, you know, so important. Um, you know, some days I do cry. I do feel such deep grief and sorrow. And I think for me as well, running and the sport for me has become a bit of a sort of way that I honour everybody and all of the sadness and grief. It's a bit, it's been a bit like how I've chosen to grieve um, is, you know, just kind of getting outside and breathing and running. You know, it, it, at the height of the pandemic, I actually realised I was breath holding. I was, you know, not so stressed and anxious. I just wasn't breathing properly. Um, so even just, you know, reminders to get out and breathe, just the, the basics have been so useful. And I, I, I'm really proud to, you know, of the variety of resources that have been offered. And, you know, there's something for everyone, I think. I genuinely think even particularly, you know, equality and inclusion and diversity and letting everybody know that it's for everybody. I think we've, you know, what I've seen on offer has done that. There's something that is accessible no matter who wow. you are, which I think is good. So it's like you didn't even have a chance A little chance bit of a segue breathe. away from how I am. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. And, and it's very interesting you say that we all have different sides of ourselves. I, I mean, there's mm. a side of me that likes to put Lycra on and dance on a Saturday night. That ain't the same Lycra, guy. Lycra, I'm there with you. It can't be a bit of Lycra for the support. Um, it's like a hug. There we go. So, yeah, we're all, we're all different. Now, Claire keeps coming and going, um, and I would love to ask her a question, but it's I, I, if she if she happens to jump up in her next few seconds, I'll, I'll allow her to, an, uh, to answer it. But if she doesn't and that is Claire she's a senior program lead of health and well-being at NHS England and NHS improvement but I, I think I could also ask this of, of well all three of you but certainly of, of M um, the same question I've just asked Zoe there which is but but on a wider scale I mean we are hopeful we are coming towards the end of this pandemic we hope and spirits are rising across the nation I'm personally cautious just as many are but where, where where is the NHS right now? And I'm not talking, you know, the, the figures that we're hearing the thing. But like, where's the spirit of the NHS? Is it is it in a good place, or are are you exhausted? I'm sure you are. <laughs> um. So look, 1.4 million people have been through an incredible. 18 months haven't they um in terms of that's the number of people that work in the nhs i think we have to be really careful when we keep talking um about frontline because actually everybody that's worked in the nhs has been um involved in covid there's been so much flexibility redeployments people have just done all manner of things to um be part of the effort to support this country through this pandemic. So the NHS is really proud at the moment, um, and so it really well should be. Um, but it's, it is also very tired, and those people have given of themselves in a way that maybe, you know, I think anyone that works in the NHS, anyone that works in public service, the magic happens when you give something of yourself. But I think what we've all seen is that we just need to treasure our staff. We need to really just put virtual arms around them and just say how how fantastic people have been. Um, we've got to recover the services that were stopped throughout the pandemic. So obviously all the focus was on critical care and really acutely unwell people with COVID. And now there is a real focus on how we restore services for patients. The healthy tension we've got to maintain is that we've got to let our people recover. Um, but you know, everybody that comes into the NHS, I've sat on numerous, numerous um, interview panels. And the thing that most people say is when you ask, why do you want to join the NHS? It's because I want to make a difference. And so everybody is focused on making a difference for patients that we are here to serve. But I think we have to make sure that we continue to recognise just what people have been through, allow people time to um, process it, get the help they need, whether it's, you know, coaching for teams to, to do that restorative supervision or it's actually top-end mental health support any of that along that spectrum is is fine um, we just need people to get the help they need but I think the NHS is a an incredible institution it's often described as the jewel in this country's crown and you know that's that's it's sparkly it's really sparkly yeah it really is and and I mean 
personally, my life was saved ten years ago by the NHS, and I have I've I've even been one of the one of the patients who, in, during this pandemic, has been in and they've managed to make time and create a COVID safe space for me to have ongoing surgery and all sorts of stuff. I mean, I, I I'd like to think I have seen up close just the remarkable innovations that have been put in place. Uh, and so, Steve Lee, I mean, that is that was that is the thing. It's Again, there has been some fantastic innovation, not just you know logistically, not just within kit and equipment, but innovations and adaptions within people as well, hasn't it? Yeah, I think that's that's right. And I think um, you know during the height of the pandemic, we saw that staff health and wellbeing was pretty much top of the agenda, uh, and the way that the nation responded to you know kind of how the NHS was perceived. My job is to to keep it there, is to keep it at the top of the top of the pile through the through the activities that we've done. Through I mean, it's before my time, but a lot of the work that that M put put in place has seen. See, 750,000 website sessions, 200, 205 app downloads to support staff. You know, there's there are huge numbers of people that have responded well to the health and wellbeing offer. It's now's the time to see what else we can do to put that put that prevention piece in place, while also ensuring that people have got the opportunity to get the support they need to recover. Fantastic. Honestly, this has been so fascinating. And as I say, um, I mean, just I'm I'm personally proud of the Invictus Games involvement within that, and you know, I'm personally proud, you know, just of the NHS in general for that matter. Um, but you know, as as Dominic said, as Prince Harry had set out in the very beginning, you know, this was an opportunity for us to serve again, and we played a very 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 tiny role uh, in in helping you guys get through this. Um, but I'm just really encouraged that this is a this is a partnership and a friendship and a you know a, a joining of families that will continue for years to come. I hope so. Thank you very much uh, for your time today and for everything that you've done. Well, forever, quite frankly. So thank you, thank you. You know, because it does It's good. This goes back more than two years, or you know, a year and a bit. This is this is the continued incredible work of that jewel in the crown, as you so rightly put it in. Um, so um, at this point, I believe we're at the point where we're getting very close to, to, to the close now. So we're, we're going to join in for a, a final uh, panel discussion, um, which um, which basically I'm going to ask a few a few people to, to rejoin uh, that have been part of this um, um, from earlier on. Um, so Dominic, we will be joining us again. Uh, Consuela Muir will join us. Professor Neil Greenberg is coming back. The team from the NHS will remain. Uh, and we'll also be joined by Mel Waters um, from uh, Help for Heroes and Air Vice Marshal Richard Whitnell as well will be joining us uh, to share their final thoughts on what has been a fantastic hour and a half, I might say. So we have about sort of 15 minutes at the most to, to, to share our final thoughts on this. As I say, there's a few faces coming back um, to the conversation. And quite frankly, I would like to say as very little as I possibly could in this. Um, so I, perhaps I might just shout out names and one by one, you can just add your final reflections uh, on what has just been a, a fantastic conversation. Um, so uh, why don't we why don't we start things where, where, where we where, where why don't we start things where we started an hour and a half ago and, and have Consuela come back uh, from the US and share her thoughts on what she has sort of listened in, 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 uh, listened to within the last hour and a half or so. Uh, first of all, I just want to say and, and thank the Invictus Gain Foundation for even making us a platform in the first place. Um, from the initial in Invictus Games in London to now to having this virtual international platform where we can share our stories and how to help be even beyond the pandemic and what, you know, what's best suited for, um, you know, for our population. But I, I think the most important thing that I took away from this conversation in the past hour and a half, and it was definitely uh, information that I have, is that we are all here, you know, to support our warriors and support their ongoing struggles because you know, as you may know, is the recovery is an ongoing process. And heard someone say earlier, they want to kind of change that term, but it's an ongoing process because you have to restructure and help them redefine what it means to live in their, I hate to say the term new normal, but to live in their now, right? 
to move forward with there now and what that looks like. So I believe us as a collective is our responsibility to help everyone within this population on how to live in your now. One of the things that I commonly tell my um, tell athletes, Team US and Air Force athletes alike, is that my job one is that I serve those who serve us. So those who protect our freedom, protect our countries, protect the way the world are, it's my responsibility in turn to help you because you've done so much for me. Two is that the focus is to empower the power of you. And what do I mean by that? Is that my goal with each and every individual that I work with is to help them tap into their, I'm a superhero nerd, so to tap into their superpowers of now and what that looks like. Try to teach them to thrive forward versus bounce back. So as we talked about earlier with, with playing with words, we, we hear very commonly, it's like, hey, you got to bounce back. Well, no, my focus is that you have to thrive for and you have to push for And the Invictus Games Foundation and all of the uh, programs across the globe that help our heroes recover using sport or any other recreational activities. I know we have hunting, we have painting, we do all these fun things um, over here in the U.S. that lean forward. But the focus is, is try to help your Try to help your heroes empower their power. Tap into their superpower. Let them know that their life has just begun on a totally different level. It makes my heart so warm and so fulfilled to see a warrior learn something new, to learn something about themselves they didn't know before because they they had this once upon a time life that now they realize they do have this love for running. Track is my background, obviously, so I have an affinity for running or archery as a source of recovery or wheelchair basketball. It has this new sense of life that, again, that I believe in Victus Games Foundation and all programs like it from across the globe that is tapped into. So I believe if we continue to do things like this, we would continue to come together and find fun and unique ways. And it shouldn't stop just because the doors are opening up in different countries across the world. But it's something that we need to stay connected to. So what has come out of this pandemic, I think from a positive, it has forced us to to figure out ways to stay connected on different levels. We figured out a way to do a powerlifting competition on Facebook Live and (laughs) rowing. Like we did it. I was like, this is going to be a disaster. Like, how are you going to do it? How are you going to pull it off? And, And it happened. I was like, okay, so this is now a thing. So we don't necessarily have to wait to meet up with Ukraine or the UK or Georgia or Italy face to face. It's like, hey, if we want to get a competition and we have some things in the works on the Team US side. So if anyone's interested, please feel free. I think my email is available, but it's real simple, consuelaforce at gmail.com if you all want in on it. But it just forces us to learn different ways to stay connected. So I continue to challenge everyone Brilliant. here and everyone watching to to continue to do so. Brilliant. Well you heard that there. Uh, perfect way to connect. Uh, also, just to point out, there's been a few requests coming in on the chat and whatnot. Um, answers to those questions, the requests that have kind of been coming in. If you hang about in the in 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 this room uh, afterwards, uh, we'll be able to answer some of those questions, share some of the slides and whatnot, uh, link people up, network, you know, expand this family, which is fantastic. Um, why don't we hear now from a new voice? This is Mel Waters from Help for Heroes. Now, Help for Heroes um, were so instrumental in, in, in the Invictus Games back in 2014. They still support the British team, uh, particularly the sort of training and support of the individual athletes in order to uh, go out and take part in, in the games throughout this last four, uh, four iterations uh, and certainly onto The Hague. Mel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I mean, reflections on not just what you've heard today, but you you guys have been a real cornerstone of delivering veteran services for the last decade, but most certainly within within uh, very difficult circumstances in the last year or so. Thanks, JJ, and it's good afternoon, everybody. It's, I'm delighted to be able to be part of the, the panel. Um, I mean, my reflections on the event today are that I am never cease to be amazed at the power of the military community to want to give back and to support their fellow veterans, their colleagues, and the wider wider communities in which they exist. Um, even from the very first part of the pandemic, uh, Help for Heroes veterans wanted to do something, as well as my own colleagues in my own team, wanted to do something for the wider community. And... 
um, they've harnessed their skills and experiences to help us uh, produce some guides for the NHS. Uh, we provided a field guide to self-care um, and some of my team buddied up with the Nightingale Hospital staff because they had experience of running military hospitals in Bastion. So that huge empathy went a long way to try and support the national effort. And, and since then, veterans and their families have helped us develop to develop more um, field guides to support anybody who would like to access them on our website to help with mind, body, emotion and support for loved ones because we've worked so so much over the last 10 years with with families of wounded veterans and you'll know that yourself JJ um, the support that loved ones provide to make someone's recovery more successful is is, is is not measurable and that's something that we wanted to do to try and give back to the the wider NH, NHS community um, and that's something that we we understand that NHS workers and staff, whether frontline or not, um, felt their situation was acknowledged by those who had experience of what it was like to go through really difficult times. And we still see the power of the military community today, volunteering in the UK particularly to assist in the vaccination rollout uh, and to assist in you know, the wider support for uh, the pandemic. So that's something that's really struck me. And the themes of that have been coming through in the in the um, presentations today. I think um, from a military charity point of view, um, we have found that it's been it's been a really tough time, but we've really been able to mobilize and to transform our organization. So I've seen a great deal of innovation and we've heard some of that today. Um, innovation to try and reach out to more people. And I think that the fact that we're able to provide virtual services um, online and also to carry on now with our face-to-face -face activity, including supporting the war injuries clinic that you know you've been involved in, JJ, I think that has been has been fantastic in enabling the community to, you know, to rise above the pandemic. And what I see in the future, probably in the charity world, is a more inclusive charity sector because we're able to reach more people in their communities and we're able to attract even greater talented workforce um, because we're able to, to, to do that both virtually and physically and, and that's something I don't think we would have seen before. Um, so I, you know, I think there have been positives all round but, but very much harnessing what our military forces have experienced over the, the, the many decades. It's um... It, it was interesting, I think I read during the pandemic that in the UK about 40% of veterans volunteered to, to do something. And that, that goes back to what the Invictus Games is trying to do, Health Heroes do, which is, which is give people a sense of service, that ability to essentially run towards danger um, when, when it presents itself. But actually it's so important to have uh, charities, organisations. When, when I talk about donations to, to military veterans, for example, I don't talk about them as, as, as generosity. I, I talk about them as an investment. If you take a wounded, injured, or sick personnel, um, veteran, those that have been medically discharged in, in, in particular, and you give them the tools to get back to where they were and that the ability to serve again, you're just making the world a better place. And therefore, it's an investment in my eyes. Um, Neil, I would love to bring you back because you were very much on your slides. You were very much uh, following the script at the time. Um, I would love to hear your, your just your thoughts. Um, uh, so take it away. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much, JJ. Um, I guess, um, you know, at heart, I'm, I'm both a doctor and a scientist and i i am always guided as much as i can by what the um sometimes conflicting evidence says and i i think that what the, what we've seen um today but also we've seen a, a lot over the last 15 months is an outpouring of really goodwill where there's a great intent to try and help people and um, both sustain their psychological and physical well-being through the pandemic but also to help them recover and i guess without trying to be um, pessimistic or too cautious what i would say is is science has told us time and time again that something that seems to be good doesn't always follow up to be good and i would strongly strongly suggest that whatever we decide you know to put our respective efforts behind that we make sure we do it gathering the right sort of evidence so that actually what we really all want to do here is to help people improve to get on their lives to build resilience post-traumatic growth 
But just throwing lots of really good will at something doesn't always mean that that you have your achieved outcome. So I would say strongly that um, let's take these great stories and let's distill from them and find out what really makes a difference. And then we want to bottle that and make sure everyone gets a good dose of it. Um, perhaps a bit like the vaccines in many ways. We don't want all the, the sort of hearsay and anecdote that's around um, to, to sort of muddy the water of what we know works. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm here to help people, but I'm also here for science because I think science will help us tell us how to help people better. Absolutely. And that's very, very important. Like I said earlier, you have the facts and figures to back it up and, and that's it. We're here to try and take that and bottle it, I suppose, stick it in a nice wrapper and, uh, and allow people to be able to, um, you know, take it by whichever means is uh, the prescribed method. Um, right. Well, um, I would love to introduce another new face as well. Um, uh, Air Vice Marshal uh, Professor Rich Whitnell. Rich, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Um, and no doubt you've been a very, very busy man since I've last seen you because you are a very busy man. You know, you've had a an illustrious career. You've served in most of the nations that the Invictus Games uh, has 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 a, a, in its organisation. Um, not just your reflections on the last sort of um, uh, you know hour and a half, but also you are a man who is always looking to learn, always looking to improve systems. As I say, you must have had a very busy year in particular. JJ, it's great to see you. Thanks ever so much indeed. And uh, yeah, really grateful to the Invictus Games Foundation for the opportunity to join another conversation. I just think this has been a fantastic afternoon. Thank you so much to Dominic and to, to Richard for the invitation. Um, JJ, I think my takeaways are just the incredible things that can be achieved when people work together in teams whether that's military and civilian teams, whether that's international teams, whether that's multidisciplinary teams. And obviously I'm sitting here in my, in my uniform as the director of uh, Defence Healthcare for UK, but actually I'm privileged to also chair Warrior Care in the 21st century. And I think a lot of the fantastic material that we've discussed this afternoon really resonates with that group. Um, for those that might not be aware, it's an international consortium that sat alongside the games in Bethesda, Tampa, Toronto and Sydney. And we're meeting again tomorrow, very generously hosted by Commodore Renko Blom, who's the Surgeon General for the Netherlands, who was obviously going to host the event uh, alongside the games. I think what we're trying to do actually plays to Neil's last point that goodwill is really, really important, but we also need to put science behind interventions. So I think, again, I've heard this afternoon the importance of research and education, clinical practice, concept development in building resilience, in trying to enhance recovery and rehabilitation, and therefore optimizing reintegration. And they actually are the three strands that sit behind warrior care in the 21st century. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute, to listen to some fantastic speakers, to learn loads. And I'd offer an invitation to anyone that would like to join us tomorrow. Uh, it's all available online. You're very welcome. It's all free to register. And again, we'll, we'll continue to grow these conversations to try and improve patient care. And if I may just make a final point, JJ, um, thank you to so much the people that have shared their own testimonies today, because the big take home for me is that this is an individual personal experience. Everybody's journey is different. And thank you very much for enabling us to learn from your stories. Thanks, JJ. Back to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, there's a question come in here, um, which I know people are getting linked, but I will just get, um, it's, it's actually for uh, Dr. Greenberg. Could you address the new clinical findings that immediate debriefing of those involved in the traumatic event can be counterproductive you'd like to hear more now i know that you guys will link but it would be nice just to hear that briefly yeah, yeah no problems at all so actually it's, it's not such a new finding it was first uh, published sort of in a way wide sense in the 2005 uh, NICE guidelines. That's the National Institute for Health and Care Excellent Guidelines. Um, but what we know is the evidence has actually been building. And um, before the year 2000, the British military used to do psychological debriefing or trauma counselling as a standard way of dealing with traumatic events for British military personnel. But in the year 2000, the Surgeon General looked at all the evidence that was available. And what was found is that, unfortunately, um, that if you take a group of people who were debriefed and a group of people who weren't, the ones who were debriefed didn't just do the same they did worse and what seems to happen is is psychological health experts sort of trauma
trauma counsellors come in and they seem to sort of disrupt normal recovery mechanisms. And there's been lots more evidence since that year 2000. So the, the UK, the Australian and even the, the US, which is the international guidance on the management of, of psychological trauma, they all say do not do psychological debriefing and there's no evidence for it. And, and the Australian and the UK guidance make it clear that actually it's not just don't do it because it doesn't work. It stands the chance of doing more harm. The role for people like me and for psychological health experts is to help the teams to support themselves and then to be available to treat people who unfortunately are unwell, you know, a month, two, three months down the line. Wow, that is absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Um, could, could I just ask um, very quickly then, just to give the final thoughts on behalf of the NHF, if, if that would be all right? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I can speak on behalf of the whole uh, NHS. No. But let me the, the, the NHS who are present. <laughs> let me give you my own thoughts. Um, yeah. So just listening to this, um, I just want to give one reflection, actually. When we've done a lot of engagement with staff, they've asked us not to use the word resilient. And it's been really interesting. So people have said, actually, can you address the root cause of why we need to be resilient rather than tell us to be more resilient? And it really chimed with me and I just thought gosh this would have been a bit of a correction in myself to think what is it that we need to do that means that we don't have to ask people to be more resilient so I just kind of share that with you because I just it's a word we use a lot um I've got three reflections and then um I've created something while I've been talking to you which I'm really excited about um, and I want to share it with you um so three reflections we use the word power and um I think I reflect on the power of partnerships and I'm really delighted that we have got a partnership and hopefully a long-standing partnership with the Invictus Games Foundation. Um, throughout this pandemic, throughout the work that I was very privileged to lead, we have created a, a whole plethora of partnerships and and I think that, that yeah, the power of partnerships for me is, is massive. The power of a common purpose and the power of the human spirit and the power of recognition of the impact of what it is to serve. Um, and I certainly am sure that that's why this partnership with the Invectors Games Foundation and the NHS works just so brilliantly well, because, you know, we, we are all in the service industry. And, um, and I just think that I look forward really greatly, actually, to continue this um, partnership over, over the coming months and years. And then the, the little thing that I was just thinking about was, one of the things that we have held really dear is that our staff are whole people. And one of the things that I was really attracted to when I first had a conversation with Richard and Dominic was that they both talked about how the Invictus focuses on the family and um, that notion that we are people first and professional second. And I really think that there is something about how we see our staff as whole people and then actually we want our people to be whole and so I've created a new little mantra for myself which is whole people and people to be whole so I share that with you with love and thanks for having us as part of your session today. Wonderful thank you so much well we're just ever so slightly running over but I don't think anyone's going to begrudge that given the quality um, of what is being said and who is saying it uh, and speaking of that the final person I'd like to just bring to the table to close things up if that's all right is Dominic Reed. Um, you know you start finish hopefully your mic's on this time <laughs> what is that? hey well reminded thank you very much yes um, <laughs> no I'd just like to thank everybody I mean this is the we just have the fifth iteration the fifth edition of the conversation i mean what a fantastic what a fantastic thing the quality um is is increasing all the time the quality of the discussion the quality of the debate um getting into the issues uh, sorting it out thinking about um the personal approach the scientific approach for me what's becoming clearer and clearer um is that it's about community it's about partnership and it's about teams it's about how people work together and interact. So the community, the Invictus community, the community beyond the Invictus community and how we get our message and our our special way of doing things uh, to that community. Um, the partnerships, all the partnerships that we, 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 we've had, partnerships with teams, partnerships between the US and the Ukrainians competing against one another, partnership with the NHS, all fantastic stuff. And then with the work that we did with the NHS, um, looking at, at, at how it, it was very clear that there was a return to the team unit and the, that the health of the individual um, really sort of resided in that 
in that in those smaller teams so some some really interesting uh, things happening in that and to become part of the community i would uh, just like to say download the app download the we are invictus app and join that community because it's there it's available um and it's a good way of of being involved uh, of being able to pay back and also to to spread the word uh, even wider so um, i'd like to thank very much everybody who's contributed today um i'd like to thank again those who who supported and sponsored us um uh, thank you very much indeed thank you jj Thank you very much. You know, it's my pleasure. Um, you know, I just, I just love this community and um, just very pleased that it's ever growing. Uh, and I just, you know, I continue to hang on with my eight fingers to it. Uh, you'll never get rid of me, even if you try. Um, right. Well, that's it. Let's wrap things up. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I, I, you know, this, this is not the end. This is, you know, I know conversations will have been born out of this. Relationships will have been born out of it. As I say, there, there, there is an opportunity to hang around at the end, have a little chat in there and try and uh, link up, answer some of the points and questions that have been coming in. Um, and, yeah, let's let's hopefully do this in person come the 18th to the 22nd of April uh, 2022 uh, at the 2020 Invictus Games. Uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure um, and I hope the rest of your day is lovely. I've been JJ Chalmers. Good night. <laughs>